Good day, everyone, and many thanks to you all for joining today's webinar. My name is Kristen Harper, and I'm Director for Policy Development here in Child Trends. We are a research institute devoted exclusively to children, youth, and families. I am pleased to welcome you all to this discussion on using policy to create healthy schools. Before we get started, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. First, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. We will be taking questions using the chat box, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the discussion and we'll get to as many as we can. If you have any audio problems, we strongly recommend that you dial in rather than rely on your computer's audio system. However, note that all members of the audience will remain muted throughout today's event. If you have any other challenges during the webinar, please do reach out to Emily Folks. You can use the chat function in the webinar or her email address to reach out to her directly. And one last thing, please note that we are recording today's webinar so that we can post it at a future date. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today. We are joined by Dr. Deborah Temkin, Senior Program Director of Child Trends Education Team. Deb is a recognized leader in the fields of school climate and school-based prevention. Her work focuses on the intersections between education and healthy social and emotional development. Previously, she served in the U.S. Department of Education, where she led the Federal Initiative on Bullying Prevention. She played a major role in creating StopBullying.gov and coordinated the first White House Conference on Bullying. We are also joined by Megan Blanco. Megan is a senior policy associate focusing on student health and well-being at the National Association of State Boards of Education, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization founded in 1958. NASB supports state boards of education in their pursuit of educational excellence and equity for each and every student. Megan brings more than a decade of experience in education delivery, policy analysis, coalition building, and government relations to this work. She began her career as a kindergarten teacher in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and is a proud graduate of, Louis of the Louisiana State University and the George Washington University. Last but certainly not least, we will hear from Dr. Jay Barr, who serves as chair of the Arkansas State Board of Education and is past chair of the Board of the National Association of State Boards of Education. Since 1994, Jay has been a faculty member in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Hendricks College. His academic work includes research on the politics of the South, state government and politics, political communication, LGBTQ politics, and the achievement gap in Arkansas. In 2014, he was awarded the Diane Blair Award for Outstanding Achievement in Politics and Government by the Southern Political Science Association. He also serves as past president of Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families and as president of the board of the Arkansas Single Parent Scholarship Fund. We have a packed agenda today. Uh, we'll start with an overview from Deb of our 50 state analysis of school health policy. Megan will then walk us through NASB's new state school health policy database and how to use this new tool. Deb will then return to provide an overview of our work to understand policymaker, educator, and student perspectives of school health. I'll then jump in to review our recommendations to policymakers on how to use a trauma-informed policy framework to create more supportive learning environments for all students. We'll then have an interview with our guest, Dr. Jay Barr, and we'll conclude with a question and answer period. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Deb to get us started on the state policy analysis. Thanks so much, Kristen. So I wanted to start with uh, going over the whole school, whole community, whole child framework, which is, under, uh, which is the foundation for all of the work that you will hear today. The WSCC model was developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and ASTD as a, an extension of the coordinated school health framework that they put together in the early 2000s. This framework covers 10 different domains of school health that all work seamlessly integrated together to support students in learning. You'll see in this framework that this covers both traditional topics that we associate with school health, such as health education, physical education, and physical activity, and nutrition, in addition to um, topics that are not typically thought of as school health, including social and emotional climate, counseling, psychological, and support services. We view these as very much integrated and important to consider together. 
And part of our uh, mission in doing this work was to see how we could support policymakers in thinking about how each component of the school health model fits together. And this is important because just in the last decade, we've seen tremendous momentum around different topics in school health. Um, we've seen growth in student nutrition and local wellness through the Healthy and Hunger-Free Kids Act. We've seen in the last administration a real emphasis on physical activity through the former First Lady's Let's Move initiative. We saw after um, a string of bullying-related suicides, a real emphasis at both the state and federal level around bullying prevention um, with recognition of deep disparities in school discipline, um, particularly for youth of color and youth with disabilities, we saw a momentum towards supportive school discipline. We saw greater emphasis on social emotional learning. And within the Every Student Succeeds Act, we saw a broader scope of our understanding of what student success means. But each of these initiatives have been acting in parallel without much communication between them. So our goal with this project was really to understand how can we further the momentum around each of these items while also helping to integrate them? We had three primary interlocking tasks. First, we wanted to understand what the current landscape of school health policies was related to the WSCC. At the same time, we wanted to talk to policymakers to understand what uh, issues were most pressing to them around school health. And together with the information garnered between those two tasks, we wanted to develop guidance that would address a policy opportunity and a policy need that the stakeholders identified. And those are the things that you will hear about today. How can you use these tools? Well, for policymakers, which is one of our primary audiences, these tools help uh, illustrate an understanding around the existing policies in your state and where gaps might exist. The ability to compare and contrast what's available in your state with other states, including direct language. Um, acts on substantial statutory and regulatory language from other states. And launch or reshape initiatives within the state based on this learning. But our tools can certainly be used by other stakeholders as well. For national and community and local organizations, you can identify areas where states, districts, and schools may need additional support understand what the national picture looks around, like around key issue areas you may be working on. For practitioners, you can understand what your state policy says and whether or not your schools or organizations are actually implementing those regulations. And for researchers, journalists, and others, all of this information is available free to use um, for research and reporting. With that, I'm going to jump into some of the findings um, from our first task, which was to map the landscape around state school health policy. And you can find this report at that website link below, and we can send that around in the chat as well. In order to map the landscape of state school health policies, we first developed a coding rubric. So each of these policies was based on a either dyadic, so it was addressed or not addressed, or triadic uh, type rubric, which addressed whether uh, issues in state policy were addressed, recommended, um, or mandated. Um, we developed this rubric based on existing evidence-based practice in each of the topic categories that we identified and existing coding schemes, including um, different national uh, coding schemes that are available um, already. We also solicited um, advice from an expert advisory panel that included voices from many diverse stakeholders to ensure uh, that we considered equity in our work. We identified topics across each of those 10 domains um, in the WSTC that I mentioned before. So they are listed here, and you can see the relative number of topics addressed in each of those domains. Um, health education, physical education and physical activity, nutrition environment and services, health services, counseling and psychological services, social and emotional climate, physical environment, employee wellness, family engagement, and community involvement. We're not going to have time today to go through each of these domains, but I wanted to give you a, a broad overview of some of our findings. Generally, what we have found in our research is that nearly every state covers many of these topics. You'll see in this map that there are 10 states that deeply cover these topics. Our definition of deep here is that 
a state covers six or more topics comprehensively, which means that more than two thirds of those topics in that domain were covered in those states. Now I must stress that even though a state might have deep coverage, it does not necessarily mean they are covering uh, school health well in their policies. There is a distinction here. This means that many topics are addressed, but we still need to do further research to understand how those policies are implemented and further, how those policies are integrated. Just because a state has several different policies on school health does not necessarily mean they're thinking about the interconnections between those policies. Just to demonstrate the range of topics that have been covered, you'll see that for most states, they are covering topics like health services and the physical environment quite well, um, with uh, nearly three quarters of topics addressed covered in um, most states. But you'll see there are other topics, including employee wellness, that are very undercovered by states. In fact, employee wellness was really only deeply covered in one state. Um, it is certainly an area of potential growth. You'll see quite a variation with, between the other domains as well. So I'm just going to briefly walk through just a couple of these domains so you can see the variation between uh, how states have covered these domains. So here we have the map for health education. And what you'll see is that 31 states comprehensively cover health education in their laws. This means that the majority of topic areas in health education were covered by those states. And you can see here a breakdown of some of those topic areas. You'll see that in health education topics, uh, most states are uh, covering nutrition and healthy eating. Uh, we have a good uh, amount of states covering mental and emotional health, but fewer states covering bullying prevention and suicide prevention within their health education laws and standards. If we move to health services, we'll see that slightly less or slightly fewer states are comprehensive, but still overall, most states are doing fairly well in this domain. And you'll see here a variability within those topics. So 45 states have laws addressing school-based health services, but only 24 states mandate a dental screening in at least one grade. For counseling, psychological, and social services, you'll see that quite a bit fewer states have, are comprehensive on this domain, only 22. And you'll see here that trauma is clearly a topic that states are not addressing, at least at this point. However, in our uh, examination of state policies, we saw that the 11 states that we saw had policies around trauma all enacted those policies in the last several years. Um, I should add here that our data are current as of September 2017, which was our cutoff um, for pulling these policies. So several additional states have passed legislation in this area since we've done our analysis. Finally, around social and emotional climate, you'll see that about half, state, half of the states, 24, are comprehensive in this area. But there's quite a bit of variability in the specific topic areas within social and emotional climate. You'll see, for instance, that several states are covering beha positive behavioral supports, but only 18 states have policies um, around dating violence. We also wanted to look across uh, domains to make sure that we understood how these are all working together. So here we looked at um, professional development across domains, and you'll see that many states are requiring several different types of professional development just in the area of school health. Some states are requiring up to 11 different topic areas just in school health. When we think about whether states have the capacity to do 11 different professional developments, we realize the really critical need to integrate across these domains. Now, I know that was a very quick overview of some of our findings, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that all of these findings can be found on the Child Trends website. We have domain by domain briefs that walk through each of the 10 domains of the WSDC, and you can see on this slide 
a picture of both the physical education and physical activity brief, as well as the counseling, psychological, and social services brief. We also have state-by-state -state profiles, which not only outline how each state is doing in comparison to the national average, but walk through topic by topic how a state is approaching those areas. So you'll see, for instance, that in Maryland, uh, there are different ways that they're approaching different topics, some where they are addressing those issues and some where they are not. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan Blanco who from NASB, who's going to walk us through the National Association of State Boards of Education uh, state, uh, state Policy Database on School Health, uh, which has encompassed these data. Thanks, Deb, and hi, everyone. Um, before I jump into the slides, I'm going to give you some brief background. Um, so NASB is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that serves and advises state boards of education as they strive to develop equitable and excellent education systems in their states. While the scope of board responsibility is defined differently in every state, there are some common areas of jurisdiction, which include setting statewide curriculum standards, establishing high school graduation requirements, determining qualifications for professional education personnel, and establishing state accountability and assessment programs. Um, one way NASB supports state boards in their work is by providing them with tools like the State Policy Database on School Health. First developed in 1998, the database tracks state-level school health policy changes and provides access to state school health policies in one convenient location. Over the years, state policymakers and researchers have regularly used the database to learn about and assess their state school health policies and to find exemplary, exemplary policies from other states. Um, the news media also regularly uh, reach out to us and they depend on the database to inform trending stories on issues related to school health. So we were really excited to partner with Child Trends, UIC, and EMT to relaunch the database earlier this year so that it better reflects the necessary and whole child approach policymakers must take to their work. Work. So you'll see on this slide, um, the database presents all of the statutory and regulatory language for the policies presented in the previous section by Deb. Um, that includes nearly 200 different individual topic areas. Additionally, the database includes the specific coding the UIC and EMT teams assigned to the policy so you can easily understand the content of each state's laws. You can view the policies by state and by domain. I'm going to quickly walk through the three ways to access the database. And in this walkthrough example, we're going to uh, use suicide prevention. Next slide, please. So first, you're going to select health education. Next slide. And this expands the menu to see all of the variables under this category. Next slide. This brings up a state-by-state -state listing of how each state approaches this topic. So I had selected on the previous slide um, high school um, for this variable. So you'll see here that Alabama has a policy on suicide prevention and curriculum for high school students, but Alaska does not. Next slide. If I click on Alabama, I'll find all relevant regulatory and statutory texts related to suicide prevention education for high schoolers. Next slide. If I'm mostly interested in state references to, quote, hotlines, um, I can instead use an advanced search function. Next slide. And you'll see here all the states that reference hotlines in state policy. Next slide. A final way to use the database is through a new visualization function, which provides a national overview for how states approach these topics. Here you see the visualization for the suicide prevention curriculum and middle school variable. When you hover over a state, you can see how the state approaches the issue. And when you click on a state, it will bring you straight to the statutory and regulatory language page I showed you previously. So as you've heard, a major goal of this project was to encourage a more coordinated, systematic, and intentional approach to policy development at all levels. And so we hope this project will help policymakers identify policy gaps as well as model policy development. And those of you who are practitioners, we hope you will use the database to compare state policy to practices in your schools, making sure that key requirements on law are being implemented. And we hope community partners will find the database to be a helpful resource when collaborating with their state and local policymakers to improve policies that impact students and school communities. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the Child Trends team. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Megan. I'm now going to shift gears and talk a little bit around our work to understand stakeholder perspectives around school health. This was, this was really important for us to narrow down where our focus was in terms of where to provide guidance to policymakers around issues that stakeholders are perceiving as most in need of attention. We aimed to speak to a wide variety of stakeholders. Here you'll see on this slide our sample. Um, we talked to 23 policymakers, and that was spread between State Board of Education members, state legislators, legislative staff, um, who represented over 15 states and territories. We also reached out to 14 educators, which were spread across um, various different roles in the school, as well as 27 high school age students um, through our relationship we have with the National 4-H. Broadly, we found two common themes between these groups of stakeholders. We found a great focus on emotional and mental health, specifically around student stress, anxiety, and trauma, as well as the need to build social and emotional skills, particularly around coping skills, as well as social and interpersonal skills. At the same time, we also heard quite a lot about school climate and culture, and the importance, particularly, of relationships between students and teachers. Now, I should stress that we heard from stakeholders an importance of focusing on all of the topics within the WSDC, but these topics above all were the ones that were most referenced by each of the three groups. And what we heard from stakeholders was that this was largely a reflection of things that were already happening. So for instance, we heard from uh, educators that in most schools, issues like physical health are already being addressed whereas issues like mental health were not getting the attention that it perhaps needed. We also heard from stakeholders that mental health and social emotional needs were perhaps the foundation to building out many of the other healthy uh, lifestyle aspects that we are also wanting to focus on. For instance, this teacher mentioned that she had students going through depression and that depression was perhaps preventing them from really focusing on healthy eating and physical activity. As I mentioned, we really heard that social emotional wellness could be the foundation for each of these other school health priorities. And it is for this reason that we decided to focus on trauma for our policy guidance. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kristen Harper to walk us through that policy guidance. Thank you so much, Deb. As you heard earlier, education stakeholders, including policymakers, have had a lot of concern about child mental health and trauma. And at the same time, trauma-informed practices just seem to be an area where there just wasn't a lot of policy content in place at the state level. And all of this is coming about at a time when trauma is high on people's minds due to natural disasters, school shootings, the opioid crisis, and other issues. For this reason, we decided to build a guidance document that illustrates how state-level pol education policies can help or hinder efforts to address child trauma in schools, um, to illustrate the linkages between the many components of the whole school, whole community, whole child framework, and the range of approaches needed to fully support children with a history of trauma, and perhaps most importantly, uh, to offer a vision for creating supportive learning environments for all students. I want to quickly walk through how we constructed this guidance and what informed its development, and this is laid out in the guidance's background section. To begin with, we wanted to offer a framework specifically designed to help state officials shift systems through policy. By state officials, we mean governors, state board of education members, state legislators, and state superintendents of education. We also anchored this guidance in a whole school approach. By that, I mean this framework recognizes that we need to do more than simply connect individual, individual children with services. We also need to ensure that the environment in which they learn is supportive of their learning. While policy does need to address the availability of tailored services, it also needs school-wide culture, practice, norms, and interpersonal relationships. We anchor this guidance also in a whole child approach, meaning schools need to consider the full range of child needs academic needs, social-emotional skills, nutritional needs, and mental health supports and services. 
Uh, the goals of this guidance also mirror those in a growing body of work that offers broad based offers a broad-based vision for equitable, more supportive learning environments for all students. Three examples I would point the audience to are uh, the Leading for Equity Framework from the Council of Chief State School Officers, the Nation uh, at Risk to a Nation at Hope recommendations, and the 2014 School Discipline Consensus Report by the Council for State Governments Justice Center. Um, moving on to the body of the guidance, uh, we designed this as a three-part process for advancing policy change. In the first part of the process, states launch a statewide initiative to create supportive learning environments. And in this stage, states build a task force to educate state officials and the public at large on the implications of child trauma for teaching and learning. This is also the stage uh, where uh, the state investigates available capacity to create supportive learning environments and investigates workforce development and professional development opportunities available to increase the knowledge of educators and administrators. In the second part of the process, states begin to review and revise state policy, and there's two parts to this process. First, states investigate and address any policy barriers that might inhibit student access to services and look for ways to increase school capacity to provide services and support. Uh, just to give an example, Medicaid, including the use of Medicaid to support free care, you know, is just one example of such policy. Uh, second, states look for uh, the second part of the process. Uh, states look for policy opportunities to address school practices and procedures that can traumatize or re-traumatize students. Uh, and school discipline policy is is one example in that area. In the last part of the process, states support locally based school-driven initiatives to create supportive learning environments. And this support can come in, in different forms, grants, technical assistance, guidance. Uh, however, as we mentioned earlier, a key aspect of this work involves shifting not only services, but the culture and norms of an entire school environment. And that means that educators and school communities really must be the drivers of the work. And the challenge is for states to identify strategies that give communities the time and space to rethink schools. The last thing I'll note is that we wanted this tool to be as clear and actionable as possible. Throughout the document, and for nearly all of the principles, we provide examples of current state statute and regulation, and these are meant to be illustrative, and just help to ground the framework by presenting some of the work that has already taken place in many states. So uh, that is uh, the walkthrough of all of the tools that we have been developing, and we hope that this suite of new resources will be helpful to you in your work to create healthier, safer, more supportive learning spaces for all children. Uh, all of them are available on the Child Trends website and can easily be found by simply searching for using policy to create healthy schools, which is the title of this webinar. So um, I'm excited that we have the opportunity today to hear from a policymaker that's worked to lift up the issue of school health in his role as chair of the Arkansas State Board of Education. Jay, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. So your perspective as a state policymaker is incredibly valuable. Um, I'll just start by asking, uh, given the tools that we've shared today, what is your what are your thoughts on how these tools can support the work of state policymakers? Yeah, I mean, I think these are are particularly exciting tools because you know, um, uh, folks like me um, and legislators who do this work, I mean, we're really swamped by reports and we're swamped by data. But I think these um, these databases are just so user friendly that. They really allow the ability of folks uh, like me who may have a, a particular area of education where I have uh, some expertise, but, but certainly cannot be a specialist across the board to really uh, figure out what's going on, not only in my own state on a, in a quick manner, but then also you know, this comparison to other states. And I particularly really like the way in which uh, we've got an avoid, avoidance of uh, education speak, we've got an avoidance of acronyms and the way this, uh, uh, all of this data is presented it makes it incredibly user friendly. And so when a, a policymaker in a given state uh, knows that they have particular challenges in a particular area, for instance in Arkansas we have uh, real uh, 
challenges related to uh, depression uh, among students. Um, HHS data is really clear that we're, you know, way ahead of, uh, unfortunately, way ahead of the nation in terms of uh, depression statistics. That there's a place to go. There's a way to find out what other states that are having more success in meeting the needs of students in that area, uh, what they've done that seem to really uh, matter. And so the combination of input data as well as output data really, I think, is what uh, folks like me need to be able to use uh, uh, learn lessons from other states. Great, that's really helpful to know. Um, let's talk a bit more about you know just the experience that you've had in in your state. Just what could you give us examples of just what policy initiatives that Arkansas has advanced to support school health? Yeah, and uh, you know I think um, in Arkansas we we have bought in fully to. Um, the WSCC model. I mean, we are really uh, um, it. It is uh, it is it is one of those things that is commonly uh, referred to as we uh, carry on our conversations uh, about um, uh, about these issues uh, in in Arkansas. Um, you know, our focus uh, very much has been on you know doing what we can to get uh, district leaders um, and building leaders. Um, uh, similarly bought in and understanding the interconnectedness of, of these different issue areas. Uh, we've tried to do some of those things um, to aid uh, those uh, those leaders around the state. Uh, we um, we created, uh, have made a major investment as a board, for instance, in uh, community and family engagement work and we're really providing uh, tools that uh, the school leaders can use to really ensure that the community and families are fully engaged and we do it in a, a culturally competent way rep, uh, reflecting the fact that while Arkansas is a fairly uh, a small state we have uh, a lot of diversity cultural diversity in our state and that we have to uh, have tools that, that have that adaptability uh, across the state so we've made a big uh, uh, focus uh, in that area uh, the second area where we've really put a lot of focus as a state board has really been on the issue issue of school discipline is that you know, we were getting annual reports on what was going on uh, in terms of discipline around the state, and we were seeing uh, the new needle moving very little, and that we were still seeing high rates of out-of-school suspension. We were se seeing a big focus on, um, on, on the types of disciplinary package, package, uh, pa practices that are not restorative, that indeed uh, go the other direction. Um, and so we, we had a, um, a year and a half long a board task force that really focused on that work and ended up developing um, a, a legislative uh, response and uh, fingers crossed I think we're going to be able to get that legislation passed in the next few days in the legislative session and that's a that's a really driven by um, uh, board work but board work that was informed by uh, this way of thinking about um, um, whole school whole community whole child that I think really uh, has a payoff and the, the final area where I think we've we've uh, put a lot of attention in uh, in recent uh, uh, months and years uh, really is thinking about about school counselors. Um, you know, school counselors uh, in Arkansas, in many states, that we have a we have a, a ratio between students and and counselors that is too high. Um, we knew that because of shortages in that area, we could not uh, reasonably bring that ratio down. But what we could do was be sure that school counselors' time was actually dedicated to student services rather than being coordinators and testing, doing all of these other tasks that school counselors are often uh, things that are placed upon them. And so we did just have legislation passed that requires 90% uh, 90, 90 of a school counselor's time uh, in Arkansas be dedicated to direct students, uh, direct or indirect student services. And so that's, you know, Thing, something that I think was going to really make a difference, not only in the lives of those counselors, but more importantly in the in the lives of those students. So I think that that what we've seen in Arkansas is um, you know conversations starting at the board level and then uh, moving into the department's legislative agenda and and moving into into legislation. I think we're we're really proud of that. Thank you, Jay. It's really interesting to hear about, you know, how exactly a, a policy agenda unfolded uh, in your state, especially, you know, the strong role that legislation played. Uh, you mentioned earlier the work to, you know, aid leaders around the state. Uh, could you speak to just the implementation challenges that 
education officials really should expect, you know, as they enact, after they enact these whole child policies? Well, I think, um, you know, and I can, I can speak mostly from the, the Arkansas perspective, but, um, you know, Arkansas is a local control state, and uh, therefore, um, you know, while uh, while the state can can um, can put forward uh, initiatives, can can aid with professional development, and do a lot of other uh, things like that. When push comes to shove, it really is whether local uh, district leaders and, and building leaders are really bought in. Uh, that's really crucial, and so uh, so that's that's of course all, there's there, there's always a challenge. Uh, there's disconnects, and a good example is, you know, Arkansas has a, a very good um, anti-bullying law um, on on paper. You know, we we really um, have a, have a thoughtful anti-bullying law, uh, but we've seen some challenges, real challenges, with local implementation of that. And so, you know, we still have you know um, troublingly high rates of bullying. Um, you know, especially among uh, LGBTQ kids uh, in Arkansas, and so you know there's 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 the vision, but then there's the, the the stage of implementation down at at the the district and school level, and especially in a local control state, you've got a lot of barriers in that in that regard. I think there's another you know big uh, challenge um, that um, uh, we know based on the research um, that. These practices, um, this uh, WSCC uh, uh, model, it's going to pay off in terms of student achievement. But we also know that there's going to be a little bit of a lag between uh, changing this worldview and achievement outcomes. Um, and that while we've moved away from um, a, a total focus on achievement tests being what, kind of what it's all about, we still know that it's mostly about that. And especially in the most challenged uh, schools and districts uh, that are most vulnerable to being uh, sanctioned in some way, those tests matter, those achievement tests matter enormously. And so I think it's very difficult uh, for folks to have the patience to see the payoff of some of these practices. We know it will work eventually, but that eventually is sometimes a little late uh, in, in, some, uh, uh, in some cases. Um, I think it, it also, um, you know, speaking from an Arkansas perspective, some things that have, have been a real challenge is just how rural uh, the state is. And a lot of um, these practices, while some of them can be homegrown, like good uh, community and parental uh, engagement, uh, other things do re do rely on on professionals and ask, ask access to professionals, um, and so you know in Arkansas we have a real shortage in terms of uh, health professionals generally, but especially uh, mental health professionals around the state, especially in the most rural parts of the state, uh, and even more dire challenges actually with dental uh, health. We have uh, a number of Arkansas counties where there is not a single dentist uh, in the county, and that is a that's a real uh, that's a real challenge. And the final area, I think, are, are really just some some cultural issues. Um, you know, Arkansas is a state where where corporal punishment is still allowed in schools, and a lot of school districts do practice it. And and while we've gotten we got legislation passed this session that uh, that uh, uh, forbids it use its use with certain uh, uh, special uh, needs uh, students, um, it's still put in place. And that some of those cultural norms uh, are very difficult uh, obstacles to get a to get across, and they do really create uh, some ongoing uh, uh, support, and indeed, maybe in some cases, perpetuation of trauma uh, on the part of, uh, of schools in the state. So, there, you know, there's still a lot of challenges uh, um, in all states, but but those are some of the ones that that I've seen at work in in Arkansas. Jade, thank you again for your willingness to share your perspective and experience. At this point. We're actually going to move on to our question and answer portion of the webinar and allow the audience to ask questions of all of our speakers. So you'll, you'll still have um, an opportunity to hear more from Jay. We're just going to open it up to all of our speakers. Uh, Emily, I'm going to ask you just to sort through what questions we've received thus far. And to our attendees, please do just take a moment now and think about whether or not you have any questions about what you've heard, any questions about the tools, the resources, any questions of our of our guest and his experience, um, you know, from the state? We'll give you just a moment uh, to submit uh, any questions, and Emily will relay those to the team. Uh, 
All right, we'll start with our first question from an attendee who writes, are there states that have implemented state policies that prioritize investing in early childhood as the foundation and framework for healthy children and families? Uh, so this is Deborah. Um, there are many states that do that. Um, that was actually outside of the scope of this current project. Um, we only looked at policies that relate to K-12 for this uh, particular project, but Child Trends has done extensive amount of work on early childhood, and we would be happy to send additional resources to you after this webinar. And just to add, um, I think for some elements of this work, Jay talked a little bit about, you know, the work on, you know, school discipline in Arkansas, but we definitely see in some areas where, uh, at least in the conversation about, you know, how do we, you know, shift policy and how do we address um, certain types of practices that may not, um, you know, either be appropriate or, um, you know, may cause further harm to children that have experienced trauma. Uh, I think many states have found it easier to have that conversation starting with our very youngest students. And so we've seen a lot of policy movement in recent years uh, to restrict the use of suspension and expulsion, for example, uh, for uh, preschool students and in you know, around first and second grade. Uh, so like Maryland is, a, is an example of that. Uh, Texas is an example of that. I think those both happened within the last two years and there have been other examples. We have another question here. Someone writes, how do these policies affect families and not just children in general? That's a great question. So one of the domains on the WSDC is a parent and family engagement domain in which we looked at, I believe, around six or seven topics of how policies act to actually engage parents within the school building. Um, there is also a separate domain around community involvement, which really talk, uh, speaks to how schools can actively engage the community within uh, school governance, as well as allow access to school facilities by the community. Um, what we see is both of those uh, policy areas are ones that are well established in state policy, but to the extent to which they're actually implemented is, is still an open question. Um, we know that parent engagement is a hugely important part of ensuring uh, the wellness of children um, and ensuring that the lessons um, that are being taught in school are reflected in the community as well. And so um, it is something that we are looking into to do some further investigation into implementation of those policies. But I encourage you to go look at um, the individual topic areas within those domains to see how states are addressing both family engagement as well as community involvement. And Jay, you spoke a little bit earlier about you know the community and family engagement work in your state. Did you have any um, thoughts for our attendee? Um, yeah, I, I do think that uh, uh, that's been an area that was that uh, everybody sees as just crucial. I mean, and, and in particular, um, it was often a, a challenge facing some of our most uh, poor performing schools academically, that that was an area where that was in, in some ways some of the lowest hanging fruit. And um, but they but a lot of those school uh, officials just did not have the tools uh, to figure out how to do it well, especially for uh, the, the kids from the families uh, that were that were most challenged academically, because often you do have, you know, issues of English lang language learning. You have other, um, you know, cultural uh, differences, barriers that are difficult for the school to get across. And so I think really thinking about giving those uh, those uh, school leaders tools they could use uh, to really um, quickly. Uh, re-engage uh, parents and families and and the broader community um, and so that's been a, a real focus but I think it's it that is an area where I think um, you know giving giving tools has much quicker payoff than maybe with some of these other uh, issues that have have longer term uh, benefit Jay we have a question that's directed towards you but can also be brought in for the rest of our panelists what is the discussion in Arkansas among legislators and policymakers regarding school hardening and active shooter protection versus the implementation of trauma-informed environments? And the second part of this question is, how do the budget lines for these two policies compare? Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, I think you know Arkansas, like um, like a lot of states following the um, the 
the shootings um, at Parkland and Santa Fe. Um, you know, we 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 had a um, um, a state uh, school safety uh, task force that, in many ways, mirrored the federal federal work. And uh, as always, I think the the conversation is is often uh, focused on issue of guns. Um, and I think, especially you know, in a state like Arkansas, where where you do have um, real cultural um, um, a gun culture that really dominates a lot of the rural parts of the state. It's, it's very, very real. Uh, we, um, out of that, um, you know, we did hire a, a state a school safety uh, coordinator, somebody uh, who is housed in the department who is really working on that array of issues. I think it's been an attempt, a, a good attempt, to try to create some balancing. Um, some of the school counselor um, legislation uh, that uh, we had been uh, I think thinking about for um, much of my time on the board actually got some fresh momentum uh, from uh, from those conversations. At the same time, there's also a lot of energy and, and conversation around um, expanding um, uh, training uh, and for include and including uh, actually bringing more guns into schools. And that was more permissive language, but it certainly. Uh, you know, is, is is all part of a balancing act. In terms of budget, that's a great question. I mean, obviously the buildings themselves um, uh, cost money. Um, I think that most of the hardening um, uh, conversations are going to be part of kind of buildings going forward rather than um, as much focus on retrofitting, which of course is even, you know, more additional cost, but I think more more future-oriented there. So, um, on the on the budget, uh, you know, the, I think that's a good question in terms of exactly how the the line items balance out. Um, and I I don't think I've seen that for Arkansas, but I know that it is uh, it is very much a balancing act. We have another two part question here. Thinking of these key issues, can you suggest any open-ended or qualitative questions to ask state or regional level stakeholders regarding systems of improvement for child and family support? And what are the most pressing issues and what kinds of questions would we be asking leaders? So I can go ahead and jump in to say, I think one of the biggest questions that our analyses raised for us is many of these states have a tremendous amount of uh, statute, statutes and regulations related to the whole school, whole community, whole child model, but it's not necessarily clear how those um, policies and laws are actually working together. Um, and so I would really be curious to ask um, states and um, LEAs and schools themselves how they see each of these elements of the WSDC working together and what ways could we streamline some of the, the regulations that they're working under to help facilitate that more integrated lens of school health. And to build on that, one of the areas where we saw just, you know, you know, good coverage of the WSDC, but it was sort of done in a way where you were just piling on responsibilities was in the area of professional development. Uh, you, we would see requirements, you know, that you know teachers be trained in bullying prevention, and then teachers would be trained in mental health, and then teachers would be trained in um, trauma. We had there were a lot of states in 2018 that uh, addressed trauma in teacher professional development, and the list just would keep on growing. And considering that there's just a, a limited amount of hours in a in a year that you can you know, provide professional development. And you know, as Deb has been saying, you know, these issues are interrelated and the connections between them kind of need to be you know, made clear with you know, how are we helping um, staff build stronger, more supportive relationships with students and what are the implications for uh, school discipline? Um, are there ways that schools are providing more opportunity for physical activity and you know what does that mean for opportunities to build student social emotional skills finding ways uh, especially in professional development to you know cover you know this this wide range of issues but do so in a way that is integrated and actually feasible just given all the things that we're asking of teachers and limited time for professional development i think 
um, is another uh, broad question that really um, merits close exploration. Yeah, I, th I think that's a that's a very important point. Is that we've got we've got so many so much so many just the sheer limitations of time on professional development, and I think a lot of you know pressure to to on the um, rifle pressure on the part of teachers to move away from one size fits all professional development to really focus on individualized professional development that really has a bigger payoff for for in the classroom. Um, I think that's a real area of challenge, and I think the degree to which we can do have a an integrated approach here, I think would really have a payoff. But unfortunately, I think in this area, as in so many other areas of of education, we have a real siloing effect as we have different people who are really different re responsible for the different parts of of this picture. And there's uh, there's some redundancies, but there's also just, just some real missed opportunities to to really emphasize the interconnectedness and, and take advantage of that. We have another question here. Our attendee writes, what is the role that you see human services agencies playing in this type of work? For example, partnering with schools to provide mental health services or consult on teaching practices. So one of the, I think there's a, a number of ways that they absolutely have to be at the table. And I think it, it, one thing, one place we should start is with the understanding that schools should not be expected to do this alone. They're going to need partners. Schools need community partners. School districts will need um, both collaboration and opportunities to coordinate efforts with local health agencies, local mental health agencies, local law enforcement and others. Um, now, one of the frameworks that uh, touches many aspects of the WSCC that we've seen in a few states, Washington State is just one example, is integrated uh, student support, um, ISS. It's often uh, sometimes referred to wraparound, referred to as wraparound services, um, as sometimes referred to as community schools. Uh, but integrated student supports is a framework where uh, you help connect students to a range of services you know, through the school, and it could include academic services or health services, but also such things as food assistance, housing assistance. Uh, the services are often extended not just to an individual student, but to the student's family uh, as well, and that is an, an example of, a, of an approach that um, in Washington actually used as its sort of cornerstone in its effort to advance education equity. Uh, but that's a, a, a good example of, of, a, of, of a step towards, you know, an effort to try to address all these different elements of the WSCC model where they would have to be close coordination between education agencies and human service agencies in order to make it work. Dr. Bart, this question is for you again. What is Arkansas doing as far as mental health screening in schools? How can we pick up on mental health issues in a school setting before it's too late, for example, in a school shooting? Yeah, and um, Arkansas has, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Arkansas has some real challenges in terms of um, uh, human capital, in terms of mental health uh, treatment. So uh, we did um, just get a, um, a SAMHSA, uh, SAMHSA funding uh, to launch a, a program that, that we call the Arkansas Aware Program that uh, uh, allows for uh, school personnel training uh, for mental health first aid and trauma-informed practices. And this has been really helpful back on the previous point uh, to, uh, to form some partnerships um, uh, with other state agencies that had not uh, ever been uh, activated before. And so we've got new um, vibrant par partnerships around this uh, program with uh, the Department of Health, the um, Arkansas Center for Health Improvement, um, Arkansas Children's Hospital, um, as well as the Department of, um, of, of Health Services, uh, Human Services, excuse me, um, that really does uh, begin to expand the, uh, the, the, the protection uh, out, in, out in the school. So that's been a, a, a real source of of activating some things that even after that grant funding is gone, those relationships will still be there and those uh, those those new ways of thinking about how to provide uh, this kind of uh, mental health first aid will be in place for the long haul. 
And this is Megan jumping in. I would also just encourage states to look at opportunities to use um, existing funding streams in innovative ways. Um, so if you're not already looking at how to use your Title I and Title II and $4 dollars under the Every Student Succeeds Act um, to um, provide health services or um, professional development for your school health personnel, you certainly should look into that. Um, you should also, um, just as, as we've touched on with the budget um, proposals that uh, the governor's office makes each year to the legislature, or every two years in some cases, um, just like really looking at opportunities to encourage the emphasis of um, providing those support services and um, community improvement initiatives that could be helpful in those budget requests. I would also encourage folks to look at, um, as you're working um, to improve policies, look at what data you already have at your fingertips. In addition to the database um, that we're providing at this national level, look at the data that you're collecting in the state already. So chronic absenteeism data, for example, could point to um, underlying health concerns that, um, that you might not already be aware of. Um, so let's say a student, students are struggling with chronic conditions in schools. Maybe there's a high percentage of uh, kids with asthma. Um, and finding opportunities to, to provide those support services and um, support school personnel and help in better identifying them and treating the students um, as possible. And so I hope those resources could also be of use to folks on the phone. And we have a related question here. What are some ways, if any, that state boards of education have been collaborating with their state Medicaid agency partners to leverage Medicaid beyond the free care rule to improve school mental, mental health? Are there any standout states that are doing anything innovative to improve capacity in schools through Medicaid to increase access to school counselors? That is a great question. Um, off the top of my head, I. I uh, don't know of state boards specifically who have been um, taking advantage of the free uh, care policy reversal. I know um, the Healthy Schools Campaign is a great group working to um, educate and build up the expertise and capacity of state health agencies and state education agencies uh, to work in partnership uh, to take advantage of that funding opportunity. And I know uh, Kristen, as she mentioned earlier, Child Trends are doing a lot of work in this space too. So maybe Kristen can provide some additional content. Context. Uh, I, I too am not familiar with the with the specific role that a state boards of education play in coordinating with us uh, with state Medicaid uh, agencies. But right now, Child Trends is engaged has begun a study to look at the implications of uh, state Medicaid policies related to the provision of free care and being able to seek reimbursement for free care and uh, what it means for school capacity to support student health and address uh, health equity. It'll be a, a two-year project. We just started it this past uh, December, and the reason we launched it was that at least as of uh, 2016, I believe the National Health Law Program found that about 22 states still had on the books policies that might restrict schools' ability to seek uh, reimbursement for uh, free care. So we're trying to take a look at that and figure out where the states are, and then we'll be doing some uh, follow-up implementation study to figure out just what the implications are at the local and, and school level. But yeah, very uh, important question. And this will be our last one for the Q&A period. We have an attendee who works at a research department at a college of education who asks, what open questions do you think need the most attention from the research community? From my perspective, I think the biggest question I have is implementation. Um, we know sort of from a research perspective what ideally should be implemented and, and in that vein what ideally should be reflected in state laws, but we don't know how the language in state laws necessarily is feeding down to the ground level. Um, in isolated cases, there have been studies around specific implementation, so implementation of local wellness policies, for instance, um, bullying prevention, um, but really not looking at the whole scope of laws related to school health um, and how schools are dealing with um, 
the, the multitude of regulations that they're under. Um, really, that would be my biggest question that needs to be answered now um, in order to really further policy development in this area. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that really is all the time we have for today. Many, many thanks to all of our presenters and special thanks to Jay for taking time out of his incredibly busy schedule to join us uh, for this discussion. For those that have additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Our email, addresses, uh, our email addresses are posted on the slide, and we did record today's event, and we'll be posting the webinar as quickly as possible. So thanks again for joining us, and have a great weekend, everyone.